بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب رب العالمين Let us make our intentions sincerely for the sake of Allah Ta'ala Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran أرسلنا رسولنا بالبينات this ayah means that Allah Ta'ala sent all of the prophets, every single one of the prophets, Allah Ta'ala sent with at least one miracle. So all of the prophets, who are about how many in number? Hundred and twenty-fourth. Aisha. Yeah? Okay. Approximately one. And, and then how many messengers amongst those 124,000? 100 and? 115? 313. 313 amongst these approximately 124,000 were messengers. There's going to be a lot of this question and answer. There's going to be some picking on as well. Okay? So just be prepared, inshallah. So each and every one of these prophets. Allah Ta'ala gave them at least one miracle. So Adam alayhi salam, he had at least one miracle. Nuh alayhi salam, and all of the other prophets, Zakariya, Yahya, Yaqub alayhi salam, all of them had miracles. Now, the miracle is this thing that differentiates a prophet from somebody who is not a prophet. Or in other words, how do we know that somebody is a prophet? We know that somebody is a prophet because he has been given the ability to perform miracles. Okay? So that's how we would know that this person is a prophet and this person is not a prophet. Because the one that is a prophet, he is able to perform miracles. So this is a very, very important, an important issue in our religion, to know what a miracle is. Because if we know what a miracle is, then we'd know that this person is a prophet and then in turn we'd know that whatever he says is truthful. Whatever he is conveying from Allah Ta'ala, it is truthful and that is what we follow in all our matters. In all our, ma in all our matters of halal and haram, permissible and impermissible. Everything that we do in this life that we expect to see the reward for in the hereafter, it depends upon the people that we believe in the message that they were given. And that is the prophet's and we know that through them having performed miracles. So we need to know what a miracle is. The miracle is like the basis. It's like the foundation, one of the foundations of our religion in one regard. So Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Arsalna Rusulana bil bayinat, a bayina with miracles. The miracle has three integrals. The first integral or the first thing that defines a miracle and all three have to be present. All three have to be present. Number one, number two and number three. If one of them is missing, then that thing is no longer a miracle. So what is the first thing? The first thing is that it has to be an extraordinary matter. I say it like that extraordinary, just so we can understand that it's not something ordinary. It's extraordinary. Something that goes against the norm. What is the norm? Things that normally happen, fire usually burns, uh, water or, or, or liquids usually, usually quench the thirst, a knife, if you have a very sharp knife and you push down on something, it usually cuts it. This is the norm. If you jump off, if you jump off the table, you're usually going to come down. This is the norm. The extraordinary is something which goes against the norm, the norm, N-O-R-M. Let's give examples then of some things that are extraordinary, out of the ordinary. Bringing the dead back to life. Who brought the dead back to life? Which prophet? Isa. Who? Isa. Isa salam. Splitting the Red Sea into 12 different channels. Sayyidi Hanif. Splitting the Red Sea. Musa alayhi salam. He is the brother of? Harun alayhi salam. Water coming out from between 
the fingers, water. Which prophet was that? Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Bringing out a baby she camel from a dry rock. Who was that? Who, who was that? Salih. I'm hearing Salih alayhi salam. It was Salih alayhi salam. Okay, as for things that are not extraordinary, but are merely interesting. Oh, you find it, you're fascinated by them. Or they may be, they may be amazing. Or they merely have this wow factor. It's not considered extraordinary. Examples are, let me give you examples. Uh, a phone. Those of you who have lived long enough, you would know that maybe 15 years ago, the, we used to have the Nokia banana phone. Remember the Nokia banana phone? And it was the talk of the town. Right? It was about this big, however big it was. And it looked like a banana. And that's as good as they could get. That was <laughs> the, um, the cutting edge technology. It wasn't actually in the technology, it was in the shape. It looked like a banana. Ya salam. So this is what they could do back then. Then, you imagine if we put somebody, not us, but imagine somebody was in a box. And then they came out 15 years later to today. And they saw people sending WhatsApp notes, voice notes, and messages, and Skype. And I remember the first time I made a conference call, even I was excited. I was like, subhanAllah, all of these people that can talk at the same time, you know, in, in, in one phone call. Uh, it's, it's mentioned that very recent, not very recently, but the first time that one of the, one of the kings of a particular country, when they put him into contact with the ambassador of another country, he had never seen a phone before. So they put him into contact on the phone with an ambassador of another country and he said, Shaytanun yuwaswisu fi udhuni. He said that there is a devil talking in my ear. He didn't believe. He didn't believe that somebody could, you know, could talk to him from so, so far away. He, they thought it was a devil. Like that, you have, you, you have other things. Like uh, when in the past they used to send the cassette, they used to get the whole family, they put it in the cassette player and they record and then they send it to Pakistan. They on the other side, maybe two months later, they play it and they send one back. So the whole process takes a long time. Now you just send a, a voice note in which, whichever format you want. The TV as well, uh, it's, it's something that it didn't exist. There was, uh, the, there was a parent, he was saying that when we were younger, my, my daughter, when she got married, her husband, she, he bought a TV home and it was something, something new. And... Uh, he said that at first I didn't understand what it was. I would go to their house and I would hear this man talking. It was probably the news. Uh, and I, I would hear this man talking. And then I accused them of, of, of having another man in the house. So why do you have another man in the house? They didn't understand that it was a television. Likewise, cars. When cars first came out, it is mentioned that they, they were amazed by it. The point I'm trying to get across is that it's not something extraordinary. It's not out of, it's not, uh, it's not against the norm. When they first got cars, they, they took a car to a village in a poor country. And the people in the village, what did they do? They picked up their buckets, they went to the river, they got water and they put it in front of the car and they said, maybe the beast is thirsty. They didn't know. They thought that it was an animal that they've never seen before. So these, even though they are things that are interesting, they fascinate people. Uh, somebody uh, getting a spoon, balancing it on their nose. Not everybody can do that. But it's not extraordinary. Many people can, but it's not extraordinary. So the first condition is that the miracle has to be something extraordinary. And the reason, remember, we're talking about miracles is because al isra wal mi'raj, which we will get to, it is a great miracle. It's many miracles that occurred for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One, it has to be something extraordinary. Two, the one that performs this mu'jizah, this extraordinary matter, he has to claim prophethood. So he performs this extraordinary matter, this shaykh khariq lil adah, something that goes against the norm, and then he claims prophethood. He says, I am a prophet. Okay? I'm going to ask some people as well. So the first thing is that it is an extraordinary matter. And the second is 
that he claims prophethood after doing it. Okay? The third thing is, for it to be a miracle, is that a person, the person that performs this particular thing, nobody else on the face of the earth, nobody else can do what is similar to it. Nobody else can repeat it. Because if there was somebody else, if they were able to repeat it, then that would discredit that person. People would just say, well, you haven't performed a miracle, I can do that as well. Like the example of a person balancing a spoon on their nose. He balances a spoon on his nose and he claims it's a miracle. This person can do it as well. These people, they made, they made a particular thing. They, they have a, a new feature on, on the iPhone, for example. Two or three months down the line, they'll have something even better than it. They won't just repeat it, they'll, they'll advance and make something better. So we don't say about things that aren't, that do not meet these three conditions. They're not extraordinary. They, the one who does it does not claim prophethood and nobody else can repeat it or do anything like it. Something that does not meet these three conditions, we don't say about it that it's miraculous. We don't say it's miraculous. We don't say about the washing machine, for example, or other things like that, that it works miracles. No, it's not a miracle. A miracle is what we mentioned here. So these three things must be present. It must be extraordinary. The one who performs it must, be, uh, must claim prophethood. He must say, I am a prophet. And lastly, nobody must be able to do something that is similar to it. In the twelfth year, the twelfth year after the Prophet wasallam received prophethood, he received revelation when he was how old, Adnan? Adnan, how old was the Prophet wasallam when he reached, received revelation? Do you remember? No? Malaka, how old? Did you hear the question? How old? Listen carefully then. How old was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he re received revelation? Nope. How old Malachi? Uh, 30 plus 10. It's 40. Yeah. 40. He was 40 Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 12 years later, Allah Ta'ala took him on the night journey and the ascension. So how old was he, Sayyidi Abdul Qayyum? <coughs> 52. He was 52, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you got to stay on your toes. Okay, I go left and right. <laughs> okay, he was 52, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It should be noted that no prophet, no prophet before the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was taken on such a journey. No prophet. So this is something that is specific to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because of the journey itself and the things he saw, the journey on the earth, which is the night journey, and then the ascension, as well as all of the prophets being brought to a particular place, being brought out of their graves to a particular place, where they all prayed behind our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it is amongst the greatest, amongst the most remarkable and the most famous miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is in two parts. We always hear Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj, Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj. And people tend to think that it's one thing, one. But it's actually two. It's Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Subhanahu alladhi asra bi'abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. The ayah means, the ayah starts with, Subhanahu alladhi. This is in reference to Allah Ta'ala. And, and, and to note here, Subhan, we don't use this for other than Allah Ta'ala. So we don't name our sons Subhan, Muhammad Subhan, Subhan. Or Subhan, whatever. We don't. We don't call our sons uh, Subhan and we don't call other than Allah Ta'ala Subhan. 
سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده exalted be the one i.e. Allah is free of being like the creation he is the one who took his slave he took Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the night from al-masjid al-haram Hamad Hamad where is al-masjid al-haram do you want to come and sit here you'll be able to concentrate more come sit over there please where is masjid al-haram really really where's the masjid al-nabawi then Ibrahim al-Masjid al-Nabawi Are you asking or you give me an answer? Al-Masjid al-Haram Did you doubt? Al-Masjid al-Haram is in Mecca right? Are you going to confirm that Sayyidina Abid? You've been there haven't you? <laughs> Al-Masjid al-Haram is in Mecca He said Min al-Masjid al-Haram ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa the Prophet was taken in less than a third of a night from Al Masjid Al Haram to Al Masjid Al Aqsa. How far are they? How far is Mecca from Jerusalem? Miles, kilometers. I've got both here. A few thousand miles. 937 miles is what I got. So, a thousand miles. Kilometers, 1,508 kilometers. So, it's far. It's far. Google would tell you that it takes you 16 hours to drive there. <laughs> the Prophet والسلام, was taken by the power of Allah Ta'ala from Al Masjid Al Haram to Al Masjid Al Aqsa in what equates to about a third of the night. It is the consensus of the people of truth, Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. They said it is Al Ijma'ah, that they all agreed. The Salaf and the Khalaf. All of the scholars, they said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taken on this night journey, this first part on the earth, by both soul and his body. His body and soul. Why did they say it like that? To prove that it wasn't just a dream. It wasn't just that he had a dream that he went there and then from there he ascended. He actually went with his body and soul, just as you are now here, by both body and soul. So the scholars, they said that it was by both body and soul, whilst he was awake, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the belief of Ahl sunnati wal jama'ah. Therefore, because it is mentioned in the Qur'an, subhanallah, asra bi abdihi layla. Because it was mentioned in the Qur'an, whoever denies al-isra, this person is not a Muslim. They are not considered to have belief in the heart because the Qur'an is something. The Prophet والسلام, came with. Somebody denies something that the Prophet وسلم, came with. Then they are not considered to be a believer. They have to believe in every single thing that he came with. So the Prophet وسلم, was in the house of Umm Hani, this female. This is his cousin. Umm Hani. She is the sister of Sayyidina Ali. Radiyallahu anhu. And she is the sister of Sayyidina Ja'far. Radiyallahu anhu. So, so Imran, what relation are Ali and Ja'far? You don't know? One second. Umm Hani is the sister of Ali. And Umm Hani is the sister of Ja'far. So Ja'far and Ali, what relation are they? Huh? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Really, I didn't hear you. Umm Hani is the sister of Ali. And Umm Hani is the sister of Ja'far. So Ja'far and Ali are brothers. Sahel, easy. <laughs> so the Prophet alayhi salatu was was in the house of Umm Hani. He was sleeping between his, uh, his cousin Ja'far and between Hamza. Who is Hamza? Radiyallahu anhu. How is he related to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam? Abdullah. How is Hamza? Hamza. What if I said to you he's his brother? Alayhi salatu was salam. Then that would also be true, wouldn't it? He's his uncle and his, his brother. How? 
because they were breastfed by the same woman. And somebody who is breastfed by the same woman, they would both become brothers through breastfeeding. So his uncle, he was his uncle, i.e. his father's brother, the brother of Abdullah, the father of the Prophet والسلام, and he is also his brother from another side, which is from breastfeeding. So the Prophet وسلم, was sleeping between who, Sayyidi Kaimash? Between who, Sayyidi Yahya? Yeah, and Yahya? Sorry? Sayyidi Muzaffir, between whom? I know you are preoccupied with the <laughs> looking after the little ones. Between whom? Sayyidi Zain, sleeping between whom? Yes, we already said that one. And remember, he's the brother of Umm Hanib. He's the brother of Ali. Sayyidi Zain. Any of the sisters between Hamza and? And now, now everybody knows. Why is this suddenly everybody knows <laughs> that? Between Hamza and Sayyidina Ja'far, radiyallahu anhu ma. So the Prophet alayhi salatu was sleeping between the two. The Prophet alayhi salatu was said that the roof of the house was lifted. So Jibreel alayhi salam, he comes, look, uh, look at this miraculous night. This is how it began. Jibreel alayhi salam, he came and he lifted the roof of the house. And it is mentioned in the hadith that no speck of dust or dirt or debris or anything, nothing fell upon the inhabitants of the house. So he lifted the whole roof off. You can imagine the roof coming off. Jibreel alayhi salam, he lifted the whole roof of the house off. He descended and he... He opened up the chest of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the honorable chest of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam. And this was done once before when he was younger, when he was under the care of uh, Halim al Sa'diyya. The chest of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam was opened, and a particular thing was, was taken up. Jibreel Alaihi Salam, this time he washed the chest of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, the inside of it, he filled it with wisdom and iman, even more iman. As a preparation for him for what he was going to see afterwards in this journey. And then he closed it back up, the chest of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The narrations, they say, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, said, I prayed al isha with my companions. And then Jibreel, he came, alayhi salam. And he took the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, to Masjid, Al-Masjid Al-Haram. To the Haram, Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Why is Al-Masjid Al-Haram called Al-Masjid Al-Haram? And I will confirm, it is called Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Like you have Halal and Haram. Why is it called Al-Masjid Al-Haram? It doesn't mean that nobody is allowed to go there. No, it is permissible. Why is it called Al-Masjid Al-Haram? Who's that behind Sayyidi Hanif? Hanif, who's that behind you? Ah, oh, Sayyidi Kashif. Why is it called the Masjid al-Haram? Yeah, certain, there are special rules. There are certain things within the vicinity of the Masjid itself with, and the Haram, that area, that it is impermissible to do. To slaughter certain animals, to pick certain things, uh, pick certain plants, and so on. So he went to Al-Masjid Al-Haram and it is there that Jibreel alayhi salam he brought an animal named Al-Buraq. It is known as Al-Buraq. Al-Buraq is an animal that was created in Al-Jannah. It was created in paradise. It is, uh, it is larger than a mule in size and it is smaller than a donkey. This is its size. Jibreel alayhi salam, he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to mount the animal, to get onto the animal. Now here, and, and as we mention these things, we'll mention some things that uh, some other people mentioned but are incorrect. 
Some people, they tell a lie and they say that the soul of a particular scholar, who was not even born yet at this time, they say a soul of a particular scholar, it came and it acted like a footstool, which the Prophet ﷺ stepped on and then he mounted the Burak. And this is not true. The scholar that they mention this about is the Honorable Sheikh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani, Al Ghawf Abdul Qadir Al Jilani. And he is a very honorable scholar and amongst the greatest awliya. But this is a lie. This is not true that his soul, it came even before, it, uh, even before he was born, even before it was connected with his body. It came and it acted like a footstool. This is something that is a lie. This is something that people mention. It is incorrect. So the Prophet والسلام, he tried to mount the animal, but the Prophet والسلام, says, فَاسْتَصْعَبَتْ عَلَيَّ This means that from the great joy that the animal experienced, because it knew that this is Muhammad والسلام, from the great joy that it experienced, it started to tremble. It started to tremble, like, like an animal. I don't know how many of you know or have rode a horse or something. Sometimes if the horse is excited, it, it doesn't remain steady. It jumps up and down. So Jibreel alayhi salam took it by the ear and said to it, Be steady, for nobody more honorable or greater than Muhammad has rode you before. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Burak, you must have heard of the Burak before. There was another Prophet who was known to ride the Burak. Who can tell me which Prophet that is? So now you're probably thinking there are about 124,000. So which one is he talking about? Al Burak. There was a Prophet who used to live in Canaan. He used to live in Palestine for a period of time. He would go to Mecca every once in a while. He would go to that. He would go to Mecca and he would return to Palestine. He had children in. He left some of his children in uh, Palestine and some in Mecca. So he would use the Burak to go and check on them. Ibrahim al Khalil alayhi salam. He left Ishaq in Palestine alayhi salam and Ismail was in was with his mother in Mecca. So Jibreel, so the Burak, other prophets also rode the Burak. So this is when Al-Isra begins. This is when the night journey begins. From the house of Umm Hanit to Al-Masjid Al-Haram, it's not far, it's not really a journey. But from then, from here until Bayt al-Maqdis, so we have two, we have two points. The starting point is Al-Masjid Al-Haram, and the ending point is in Jerusalem, Bayt al-Maqdis. And on the way, they are going to stop at particular places. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he climbed onto the animal and they set off. And something special about this animal is that its stride, its one step is as, is as far as it can see. So it moves really quickly. It moves really quickly. Jibreel alayhi salam, he requested on the journey that the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam descend from the animal and that he pray two rak'ahs, two cycles of prayer. Jibreel alayhi salam asked, do you know where you prayed? He said, I, did, I don't know. Allah knows best, that's what he said. He said, Allah knows best. Jibreel alayhi salam told him that you prayed at Yathrib. And Yathrib, as you know, is Taiba. As you know, is I didn't hear except like murmuring. Oh. Al Madina. Al Madina. Then it set off again. It stride reaching as far as its eye can see. Then they reached a place where Jibreel alayhi salam requested that you descend here and you pray two rak'ah. You pray two cycles. Jibreel alayhi salam asked, Do you know where you prayed? He said, Allah knows best. You prayed. Jibreel alayhi salam asked, Do you know where you prayed? Rather, you prayed in Tur Sayna. Where is Tur Sayna? Where is Tur Sayna, Sayyidi Akhlaq? 
Tur Saina, no helping, okay, no helping. Where is it? I am, but I'm just saying it because I know you're trying to help him. Where is Tur Saina? You, you don't remember? Tur Saina? Come on. If you don't know what Tur Saina is, what if we had people from where Tur Saina? What if we had those people from that country here right now? They'd be. They'd maybe think that Subhanallah, they don't even know what Tur Saina is. Sorry? Egypt. Egypt. Have you ever been? To Tur Saina? Yeah. Wow, mashallah. Mashallah. To me. Tur Saina is, is, a, is, is a mountain in Egypt. And that is where Musa alayhi salam heard the eternal and everlasting kalam of Allah. Allah, his speech is not like our speech, it's not a language. Not Arabic, not Syriac, not Punjabi, not Urdu, not English. It's not a language. It's not made up of letters. It doesn't start. It doesn't end. And it's not made up of sounds. This is the kalam of Allah. In that place, Musa alayhi salam was given the ability to understand the kalam of Allah ta'ala. To hear the kalam of Allah ta'ala. It's not like the kalam of the creation. So it's a special place. There, Jibreel alayhi salam requested that, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you descend and you pray two rak'ah. That is Tur Sayna. So I'm going to ask you as well, inshallah. Where have we stopped so far? Al Madina and Tur Sayna. Tur Sayna. Usually in the Punjabi language they say Tur Sina. But it's Tur Sayna. Tur Sayna. Then they set off again and Jibreel alayhi salam requested that he descend and pray two rak'ah in Bayt Laham. This is going to be interesting. Bait Laham. Where is Bait Laham? Ihtisham. Bait Laham. Where is Bait Laham? Bait. Welcome. Bait Laham. Bait Laham. Where is Bait Laham? Palestine. What do they call it in English? Bethlehem. How is it that everybody knows? Wallahi, afterwards, like it seems. Everybody knows afterwards, but when it comes crunch time. <laughs> Beitul Laham, what is so special about Beitul Laham? Beitul Laham. Isa alayhi salam was born. Yes. Then, when they reached the gate of the city, Jibreel alayhi salam, he tied Al Buraq. And then they entered the masjid from a particular door. So, so far, from A to B, from Al-Masjid Al-Haram to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, they have been to Yathrib. They went to Tur Sayna, amongst the places that they went to. They went to Bayt Laham. They went to Madian as well. This is amongst the places that they went. Madian is where Shu'ayb alayhi salam resided. Ahl Madian. They also passed by certain other things that are mentioned in other narrations. One of those things is that the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, the world was brought to him in the shape of an old woman, a very old woman, who was decorated. She had gold on and jewels and Extravagant decorations. This is to show that the world, it decorates itself for people. The Prophet ﷺ said, Ad-dunya hulwatun khadira. The world, it's, it's green, it's full of flora and fauna and trees and beauty. And this can be sometimes, if a person is not on the right track, this can be very distracting. Like that, a person can get involved, they can become negligent. And they can get themselves involved in things that don't concern them. What does that mean? Even that, that don't concern them. The Prophet ﷺ said, What doesn't concern a person, a person shouldn't get involved in. What are those things that do not concern a person? Those things that harm a person in one's religion, they don't concern us. 
Alcohol, for example, doesn't concern us. Pork doesn't concern us. Meaning that we don't give it any importance. We don't go that way. That's what it means. The haram doesn't concern us. Meaning that we should not put an active effort to acquire it. And we should put an active effort to stay away from it. So he saw this. He saw Iblis. Allah. He saw Iblis Aydan, uh, also. He saw... He passed by the grave of a woman. And I want to speak a little bit about this woman. He passed by the grave of a woman whose scent he could smell coming from the grave. And you, we all know this is the woman who used to comb the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun. Now, you can imagine, from the time of Musa alayhi salam, which was a long time before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a long time before. From that time all the way to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this smell, you can imagine, it's been exuding, it's been coming out of this grave, this nice, pleasant fragrance. What must she have done? She wasn't a prophet because women are not prophets. What must she have done? One day she was combing the hair of the daughter of Fir'aun. She was like her hairdresser in that sense. She was combing her hair and she dropped the comb. When she dropped the comb, she said, Bismillah. Like you have, you have a reaction. Before you go into the bathroom, you say a particular thing. Before you come out, or when you come out, you say a particular thing. Before you eat, you say Bismillah. It's like a reflex. You say Bismillah. She said Bismillah. Now what we've got to remember is, to put it into context, is that Fir'aun, he used to say about himself, I am God. Really, he would say, he, he, he is Allah. Everybody in his kingdom, he would have them believe that, otherwise he would have them executed. This woman, she was somebody who concealed her iman. She was a believer in Musa alayhi salam. Because all the prophets, they are on al-Islam. They are upon al-Islam. So when she dropped the comb and said, Bismillah, her daughter, the daughter of, not her daughter, the daughter of Fir'aun, when she heard this, she was surprised. She said, you have a Lord other than my father? You have a, because this is shocking for her. You have a Lord other than my father? And look at the bravery of this woman. This woman knows that there will be repercussions. This woman knows. She's trying to teach this child. She said, my Lord, my Rabb, my Lord and the Lord of your father is Allah. It takes a very strong woman to say something like that. This girl, as can be imagined, she went and told Fir'aun, her father, about what this woman had said. So, he ordered that a, a container, a large human-sized cauldron be brought forward, and that water, and some said oil, be boiled within it. So you can imagine, it's bubbling. So he said to her, and sometimes this story is mentioned very quickly and people don't get a chance to appreciate it. He said to her, I want you to leave this religion that you're on. I want you to leave this belief that you are upon and I want you to say that I am, this is what, you want, what he wanted, I want you to say that I am your God. He threatened her, he said to cause her pain. He said, I will throw your children in one by one. Now, for one child, one child, this is heartbreaking to say the least. This is crushing for one child to be thrown into a cauldron and to, watch, to see the skin disconnecting, separating from the bones and the limbs coming apart in front of one's eyes. Hair burning, the smell. That's for one child. She had seven children. So here, you can imagine if she was somebody who was weak-hearted, if she was weak-hearted, she might have said, I won't say Bismillah again. At the very least, she might have said, I won't say Bismillah again. She might even have committed blasphemy. Because here, it's no excuse. She's not excused. She can't say a blasphemous word here in this situation. She's not allowed. 
Hypothetically speaking, she might have said blasphemy, but she didn't. She did something, she showed resilience, and she showed strength. She showed that she has a heart stronger than the hearts of thousands of men. She said to him, to his face, your Lord and my Lord is Allah. He threw the first child in. You can imagine, just imagine this child, the eldest child. She probably thought, I'm going to get him married off. I have taken care of him since he was young. I've fed him. I've changed his, I've changed his nappies. I've cleaned him for so long. And he gets thrown in and that's it. But she doesn't leave her religion. He asks her again. She says, no. The second child is thrown in. The third child, the fourth child, the fifth child, the sixth, her whole life, her whole life. The sixth child is thrown in. And then they get to the smallest, the youngest, the breastfeeding child, the innocent breastfeeding child. And she says, he says to her that this is your last child. And it is then that in the hadith it's mentioned that she, she got a feeling in the heart like, like a weakness, metaphorically speaking, in the knees. That this is her youngest child. She has been through so much up to now, and this is her youngest child. She didn't doubt. The scholar said she didn't doubt. She didn't say, oh, let me commit blasphemy. Let me save my child. No. But this is her youngest child. She just, she felt something. And she was amongst the awliya. She was strong. Like I said, she showed a heart stronger than the hearts of thousands of men. Many men would crumble in that situation. Crumble. But she watched six of her children melt, burn. When, this, when it came to the last child, Allah Ta'ala gave the ability to this child to speak. And the child said, O oh mother of mine, and this is something that is considered a karama, it's considered an extraordinary matter, but she did not claim prophethood, so it's not a miracle. It's an extraordinary matter that occurs for the awliya. The child said, O oh mother of mine, be patient. For the punishment in this life, or the pain in this life that he would experience, the pain in this life, it's much less than the pain in the hereafter. So she, she watched her seventh child die. Many of you don't have seven children. Many of you don't have six. Maybe five. She said to Fir'aun, I have a request. I have a request and that is that you gather the bones and you put them in one place. He said, lucky darling. He said, I will do that for you. And then he flung her into the cauldron as well. And she, she died a martyr with her children. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, as he passed by this area, he asked Jibreel alayhi salam, what is that beautiful smell? He told her it is the smell, the fragrance of this waliya, Habibatullah. This waliya who sacrificed her children for her religion in this way. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he saw many things on this journey. We'll mention it in the second session. Uh, when is the break again? Got to pray as well. Okay, any messages before? Afterwards. Okay, now we are going to, inshallah ta'ala, finish off. Uh, refresh. Oh, yeah. The refreshments for the, for the brothers are here at the back, and for the sisters, they are inside that room and the parent and baby room inshallah after that we will pray al maghrib and then we will have a second uh, session inshallah ta'ala at 2035 at 8:35 yes okay let us inshallah ta'ala say la ilaha illallah and as ala al-nabi in the next session we will mention al miraj we'll finish al isra and we'll mention al miraj uh, inshallah ta'ala let us say la ilaha illallah لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله لا إله إلا الله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم 
اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم so if the sisters can 